All right, welcome to another guest episode of Off Course. I am your host, Hamilton Sividas, and today we have a spe very special guest in the building. He's not just a guest, he's a friend of the show and a collaborator. His accomplishments are way too long to list, so I'm going to try to quickly read them off for you. He's a two-time Juno Award winner, multiple gold records, has generated hundreds of millions of streams on all streaming platforms, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, you name it. His most recent album, the new DNA album by XG, went number one in Japan and 17 different countries on iTunes. I have none other than the boy Lance in the building today. What's up, bro? What is going on, bro? How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm, I'm excited to Glad to have here. you here on the show, yeah. finally. Yeah. Also, we have, helping me out today, as usual, we got Darren on the boards. Darren, say hello. Hey, what's up? Next to Darren, we have Delon, who yeah. just joined our team very recently. So Darren handles all of the boards for us, all the cutting on the show live. Delon handles all of our Google searches, and he's also a live shooter. So if you see a camera moving around today on our episode, that's him. All right, brother. We're ready to get into it. We're here, bro. How you feeling? I feel good, man. I feel good. I'm really excited. Um, I, I I've loved you know the last episode that you had. It was, he was such a great guest, uh, Dinesh. Yes, right? with yeah. Dinesh. Yeah, great guy. He seemed like a really cool dude. It was. Um, it was good. It was good. But yeah. you know what? I would not have been able to do that episode or even this episode with all, all the help that you've given me over the last six seven months. That's a story that we'll revisit on another episode, but let's get yeah. right into it. Okay. XG, bro. Yeah. Tell me about this little bit of period, like this period that you've been dominating for the um, last eight months. You've been absolutely crushing it. Yeah. So you started working with these guys. When did you start working with XG? Uh, we actually started working on the XG stuff in 2019. Um, oh, wow. So it was a while. So for producers listening, this is like very important because that this thing that you started working on 2019 didn't materialize yeah until 2023 um covid was definitely a big reason why that got set back mind okay. you there's many cases where songs are written a couple years prior to their actual release and they sit on them whatever so it's it's not like it's nothing new waiting for your songs to get you know, uh, but, uh, but released it, sometimes it's it, yeah it's pro it's a very normal aspect of the industry but it's something to highlight just because i think a lot of people think you could just do the record put it out if it's yeah. a hit you'll make the money right away but really it takes time to develop this it does take a lot of time that's yeah. that's a big part it, it's patience it's a lot of waiting and eventually you know you want it to just snowball where you know you have a bunch of songs and then eventually they all start coming out one by one by one by one and they kind of keep up with themselves yeah um but the process of the xg stuff specifically we started working on that in 2019 i went out to tokyo yeah um a uh, really good friend of mine, Joe, um, 220, who's part of UP Music, um, UP Publishing. And he is And UP amazing. Publishing is based out of? Korea. Korea. So he's based out of Korea. And he's an awesome dude. And him and I got along immediately when we met. We ended up running into a session together. Before that, I think in like 2017, when the idea of XG was starting to be put together. Was that here in Toronto? And that was in Toronto. Okay. And, and, and um the cool thing about that was it was a situation where I got a call from someone and they're like, Hey man, can you go do this session for me tomorrow? I can't make it. Uh, it's you know, this guy's in here from Korea right now. Um, it's, it's, it's a K-pop thing. Uh, are you down? And I'm like, I don't even know what K-pop is. Yeah. I didn't know there was a K before the pop. I thought it was just pop. <laughs> and then they added, you know, and so I was like, all right, cool, whatever. And so, you know, I go, he, and I, I met him and you know, what a solid dude. And he really broke down the K-pop scene for me, broke down the structures. And then we started working on songs then actually yeah. for XG. And then it wasn't until like a year or two after, um, things started to really materialize. And he had, uh, hit me up and had like, Hey man, come out to Tokyo. We're going to write some songs for this group. Yeah. This is what we're doing. So it would have been in 2019 when we actually started writing the songs, like for example, like girl gang, Papa Cho, TGIF, like those were all done in 2019. Okay. So before we get into that backstory, can we just quickly explain to the audience uh, a, a little bit about XG, who they are, how, like how they came to be? Yeah. Um, XG is <clears throat> a, a, a Japanese group based in Korea. Yeah. Um, and just an elite team of really talented girls that are phenomenal. And um, how many how many members do we have? Uh, yeah. So there's there's seven members. Okay. Um, and yeah, each one has their own individual talents. Um, so when we were working on the songs, we, you know, when we went there, actually, they had a little performance for us. So we got to see how they performed and like how they were. And I was just blown away at how like tight the choreo, the dancing was, the performances, like 
really good singers, really good rappers, just all across the board talent. And so when we were writing these songs, we were writing these songs with each individual person in mind of like who would do what section for these songs. So it was such a magical experience to even get to do that and very eye opening to think of it that way where you're writing for a group versus writing for an independent artist or working with just an artist. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It made me feel like it was like the early 2000s, like the boy band stuff, you know, which I've always like you looked up to yeah, growing yeah. up. So it was really cool to get to be a part of that. Um, yeah, the whole process was amazing. It was so much fun. Like as an outsider looking in, the way they build music over there is similar to how we did it in the 90s and the 2000s. We've just stigmatized it now in North America, right? I, we have the label, um, what's the word? Industry plant, Yeah, right? So whenever a, a, a label puts together an artist, we call them manufactured or we call them an industry plant. Yeah. But really, that's how the music business has operated for as long as it's been around. It's always we, been that way. I, I think you're right. And I, well, see, this is the thing that is a little challenging where we call them an industry plant, but it's like, I don't think it's necessary to call them an industry plant if they've been kind of doing their own thing and grinding their own ways and then a label decided to show interest in them. They're still going to be themselves. You know, it's it's not. Yes, it happens, but it also doesn't always happen that like an, a label is going to tell you like you got to make music like this or you got to do this or you got to do that. Especially in a modern day, it's much more like you know, keep doing what you're doing because it's working. You're gaining buzz. We're going to just put the machine behind you and support you. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like there is more industry plan if you were to think about it, where they have you know a hundred people and they are all trying out for this group and then it kind of gets broken down and they're 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 trained built exactly and put together through the system i think that's more of an industry plant than what we have well if you look back on like you know i always refer to it as like the pink bubblegum pop era yeah, yeah, yeah right like if you look at that era where it was like the the backstreet boys and sync britney I, spears i agree with you on that 100 yeah, like, so i would say yeah like though I, i'm pretty sure all those bands it was like an audition process yep. you get the best members you fill out their different types of vocals and then you form the band that was the the, the disney days yeah the disney days the disney exactly days. exactly yeah, yeah. and that's how we used to to build music we don't yeah. necessarily do it now what mm. labels are i guess what again you correct me if i'm wrong but from the outsider from as an outsider looking in it feels like labels are less willing to make that investment they're expecting you to do that on your own yeah and then once you've kind of built like your your foundation they'll just piggyback off of you yeah i feel like it, that's exactly what it is it's a little bit more of a piggyback scenario mm -hmm. um they're reactive. They're not proactive. Record yeah, labels. definitely. I definitely feel that way where, you know, I find out there, I enjoy it more because the process is streamlined. You know what they're investing in, you yeah. know what they're building. Everybody is just, you know, firing on all cylinders most of the time. So, you know, it's going to like ARs who also are musically trained. It's everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody's the involved in the music industry and understands music first. Yeah. And also then understands like how to sell it. They know their audience. They do their homework. Yeah. Where here it's a little bit more out of touch. I feel like, you know, a lot of the times they're just taking. Um, well, you you kind of like alluded to that just now. Like we're we're very disjointed here. Yeah. Right. Like there it's there's like there is a chain of command almost like mm. you take the artist from here to here to here to here like it yeah there's like almost like a ladder that they climb yeah it's not really that here it's kind of just like oh this this there's a bit of energy behind this record right now let's yeah. see if we can jump on this how good are they doing on tiktok exactly how good are they doing on tiktok that yeah. that's kind of how we gauge if something is good or not yeah versus there they just kind of know yeah so let me ask you this you've worked in the you know the north american industry for 10 years before it was about 10 years probably before you got to the xg project yeah how do you feel, how, what are the differences that you've seen between the two um, industries? I mean, the same industry, music, yeah. but it's two different um, countries. Um, work ethic yep. is a big one. I feel like they, the people that I collaborate in that industry are much more strict on the quality of product. Yeah. It's much more, um, let's get it right. Let's get it right now. Yep. You know, not, not like okay, let's come back to it later. It's like, you know, if we have the time to fix it, let's fix it now. Like, mm -hmm. let's make sure every single section piece, everything feels perfect, feels good, feels right. Right. Where here I feel sometimes people are just like, oh yeah, you know, yeah, the song's sick, but you know, and it's just like, what do you mean? You know, it's like, you should be able to sit down and be like, well, what's not feeling right about the song? You know, you should be able to kind of pull back and be like, okay, we've listened to this song for three minutes. Is there a part that you feel disjointed from? Is there a part that you disconnect from? Is there something that doesn't feel right? Because if so, then that's the time where you kind of go back to that section and be like, you know what? Second verse, 
something's slowing down. Okay, well, maybe we got to change something up. Yeah. You know, I think that attention to detail isn't as much here as it is there, which is something that for me, I love because I love trying to find everything wrong with my song that I'm working on. So then that way I can keep refining it to make it to a point where I can feel 100% connected to the emotion of what I'm trying to convey in this record. Right. So, uh, but see that, that, and that's the thing that, that workflow is not conducive to the way North Americans move. Yeah. It's, it's too slow. There's too many roadblocks there. We hear it. We just kind of want to put out as much music as quickly as, as quickly as we can. Yeah. We don't really care if the record dies out after one to two weeks yeah. versus there, they put so much energy behind the music. They're looking for a long run. They want to yeah. be on billboard for like, three to as six long months as possible yeah like here we're not really thinking about charting we're really just thinking about how much attention can we grab that yeah. so it's, it's a very different formula completely different different, formula. different approach in terms of what what is the end goal of putting out this music yeah you know what i mean like there they're actually trying to establish careers it feels like yeah here we're just trying to see how much attention we can grab so we can leverage that to sell you something it feels much more risk risky here where it's like i feel like there they kind of will generate a higher success rate. It's like, if you can generate a higher success rate, why wouldn't you do that? Um, also, just the amount of effort that goes across the board. Like, the, the, there's just so much involved in it from like, you know, the songs being great to the music videos being phenomenal, um, which was a, a part that I loved because the music video budgets are just wild. It's literally um, like what we used to have back in the day. Yeah, dude. And a um, million dollars, two million dollars on a music video. Yeah. And, and selling physical CDs is the coolest thing in the world to me. You yeah. know, like getting to have a physical copy of something that I got to be a part of and then hold that and be like, I have a physical album that I worked on. I thought I would never get that day in my life. And then when I had that day, I was like, yo, I can't believe that even happened. Like, I thought the era of CDs were done, but albums still sell like crazy out there. Physical copies because they they give you an experience when you buy the album. Well, it's, it's something tangible. Music is not tangible. And if you're not buying merch you don't yeah. really have a way to connect with the artist. Yeah. Right. So like for me, when I was growing up, like I, I, I never bought merch, but I would always buy albums and that buying that album made me feel like I was closer to the artist. Dude. Yeah. That so, was my favorite time. Just, I would always get the albums and just read the liner notes. Yeah. That was like one of my favorite things. I remember yeah. you and I would try to get like the rare albums of our favorite artists. Like exactly. You, the the Jay-Z black album. Yep, yep. The actual black, the actual Jay -Z black, black album. Yeah. Uh, he had, uh, man, he had the coolest stuff. The blueprint had actual blueprint paper. Yes. I had to get that from a different country yep. to get that one. Yep. I have that one at home. Then I, I remember like, yeah, we're, 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 we're music nerds. Literally. I think you, you will got, you guys will come to know that over time. Um, as he come, as Lance comes back on the show to collaborate, but we're absolute music nerds. Yeah, right yeah, now. we definitely are. That's kind of like our 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 biggest thing between each other. Yeah, our, our friendship it, was always built on like just on being music, super music nerds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this: So if you were to bring back some elements from that scene here to the North America mm. to kind of improve our systems, you know what would what would be the two things that you would say we should definitely bring back here? Um. In terms of in terms of what just improving, so improving the way we operate the business here, right? Because okay. there's a massive disconnect right now, mm -hmm. right, between the record labels and the artists and the way we put out music. Everybody is just doing their own job, yeah. And then at some point, you know, this feels right. Okay, I think we there's a play here. Let's all come together, put it out, whatever. Yeah. Right. What is there anything that you feel like in terms of practices that they have in Japan and Korea? that they could bring back over here that would help us maybe? Yeah, um, I think attention to detail mm -hmm. in knowing your audience. I think um, I think that when you are, especially when they're like signing new artists, it's like, you know, really get that artist to build up their, their track record and their songs, but also like having that, having the, cons realistically, the way that I notice things that do really well, they have everything ready to go. Yeah. You know, it's not like we have one song, we're going to put this song out. It's like, great, what are you going to do after that? Exactly. And that is always the question mark right here that I notice. And I'm like, so what's the second single? Yeah. What's the third single? Yeah. Like you should have that mapped out already before you start this whole machine. Um, because otherwise, what's the point of the machine? You're just putting things on Spotify or you're putting things on Apple Music for me. You know, you don't need a crazy music video here. You can do it on an iPhone. That's fine. We don't have to worry about that. But yeah. I think it's like, you know, allocating budget where budget might need be more important in North America, really minding how the marketing is approached. I yeah. think the marketing is almost non-existent. It's non-existent. So like, just to kind of give you guys an example, 
XG, like this is their debut album, right? This is the album Lance worked on. So you have three records on here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you've produced and you've written on here. Yeah. So like just take in the packaging for this. This is like above and beyond in terms of how you put out a product. Like, so there's the slip cover. I think that's right here. There's another cover on top. We got a book. I feel like we're doing an unboxing. Yeah, video. It's like a, this is this is nuts. <laughs> this is crazy. Like this this doesn't feel like an album. And then you have the, the CD right here. There's like a ticket, I think, for the show. They a, have live a live ticket show, for a live yeah. show. So tattoos, so we can do matching tattoos, tattoos later today. Where is that? Right here. Look right there. Tattoos. So it's just like the attention to detail, you know, in other parts of the world. Yeah. We don't have it. No. We don't have it. And the only time we have it is when it's a big, big artist. Yeah. They're the only ones that are able to fund projects like this. Yeah. This is kind of like a normal thing over there. This is how we were to put somebody out. Yeah, bro. If you go to, uh, it's crazy to see. And I, I, I feel like I'm just right place, right time. And I'm so yeah. grateful and I'm so thankful um, because it's like, you know, uh, I went to Markville the other day. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's actually where I ended up seeing that album that was in, in one of the stores. And they have another store there. And I saw the XG album again. So yeah. it's like there's stores all over the place, which goes to show you there's clearly a demand for people wanting to buy physicals, physicals you know? And it's because they want the collectors of things. Like yeah. we collect shoes. I collect Funko Pops, shoes, Ex like all this stuff. It's like you want to have the collectibles of your favorite artists. I, I, I agree. I just, I, I, I just wonder though if the mentality like is is destroyed here in North America. Mm. Like I I agree with you. I'll buy physicals all day, no yeah. problem. Um, I don't know. Again, I don't want to get into this too deep because it's a super big conversation that we we'll could come go back for to. Hours on that. Um, but like, yay, Kanye, he wants to drop Vultures too yeah. as a uh, physical only. And right that. now, people are kind of like you know giving him some pushback, saying like this is not really the way to go because it's going to get pirated anyways. Yeah. And his whole thing is my my I don't remember I don't know the number, so I'm not going to say it right now. But he has X amount of followers, and you know only five percent of it would still get him a million sales, which is seven hundred thousand more than the biggest album of last year or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying, and I agree with that. I think we have to change the mindset a little bit. Um, and get people to be conditioned to wanting those things, like a physical album, the way, same way you want merch. Yeah, I think a cool way to go about that would be like if, like, it's like the way movies are in theaters for a little while and then they come out on streaming. Mm. I think it would be cool if it was like, you know, for a set amount of time, you could buy the album and then, yes, you know, it would come out on best. streaming. I think that'd be a really cool way to approach it. Yes, you're going to have people bootleg it. That's always been the case. It's always it doesn't been. matter because it just makes that exclusivity a little bit more fun. But yeah. then also, like, also don't just give me a, 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 a an empty CD case with the CD in it. Don't give me a Yeezus physical because that really, in my mind, was like one of the lowest points. Yeah, yeah. When I saw the Yeezus thing and I'm like, it's just a clear CD with an orange sticker. And I get it. Art. Yeah. But also, like dude you want an experience <laughs> i wanted the experience you want like, an experience you know for and sure. i get it it was edgy but i it, there was probably a, like a million other ways you could have went about it there there was but if you're just looking at it from the perspective of you're just buying a cd it then was sure yeah for sure it was kind of cool like you're buying a cd for 14 dollars it's it's, it's kind of uh, it cool. really cool because it was the first time to do it first but then time it's to do like it. you know yeah. where do you go from there yeah yeah and yeah, then yeah, you just yeah, let's yeah. Just, oh i got an idea how about we don't even sell the cd yeah and yeah. now you that's where we are <laughs> so now we can see how we've come full circle in this product um okay so you so xg that's kind of that's what you've been working on for the last six seven months now yep. well that's the project that you've kind of been promoting you've been putting out yeah, I, I kind you've of, been working on that for years actually yeah from before that yeah so i guess you probably have tons of things in the pipeline now in yeah. that space yeah so are you kind of pushing more towards the k-pop scene more so than the north american scene or i feel like you're yeah. just having fun doing everything right now I, to be honest with you dude like you know um like i just came out of my publishing deal mm -hmm. um that i was in for quite a while and um are you a, gonna say who you were assigned to yeah i was signed to warner chapel for a little bit on on um out in the north american area and uh <clears throat> yeah it was fun man it had like a canadian american thing going on whatever but it was fun I, I think i learned a lot from it i got a lot of experience out of it doing a lot of different song cams meeting a lot of people um was it as rewarding as i wanted it to be no I don't think so. I don't think it was like, I don't even think it really scratched the surface for what my expectations were for what the reality was. Mm -hmm. um, it's like getting a product off Amazon versus Timu. You know what I mean? Mm. So, um, and to really see where I'm at now, I'm like, you know, being out of that, I just feel like this, this weight has been lifted and I feel like I'm just having the most fun 
I've ever had writing music again. Like, I feel like it's just like back to basics for me where I'm just like, I'm just doing everything. I'm focusing much more in K-pop because mm -hmm. for me as a creative, as a producer, it's like a producer's playground. I get to have so much fun. Yeah. You know, instead of me working on like a 16 bar loop and then just being like, we're done. It's like, no, now I like K-pop, I get to write, you know, like six or seven different parts to make this whole body of work all sound cohesive and fit and feel like this fun sonic journey so that way by the time you're done listening to the song you're like wow what a roller coaster of emotions right so i have so much fun doing that um i'm enjoying doing like a lot of like the sync stuff right now too you know like for like video games tv movies that kind of stuff um so you're doing the sync stuff is what so you're I'm talking doing a little about. bit of the sync stuff as yeah. well which uh just if, if people don't really know yeah, it's essentially you, you're doing you know songs for um, you're doing songs for like TV commercials, uh, video game commercials, video game soundtracks, anything in that world really that's outside of maybe just the music industry. Yeah. It'd be like more of that medium. Which and, you've, one, and you've done sync work before. I've done sync work before. Like I've had tracks in Madden. I've had like full songs in Madden. We had the Charmaine song in Madden. Um, we have the Char Charmaine's bold right now is all over our TVs with, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, the real Canadian superstar. Okay. So they just yeah, relicense yeah, yeah, yeah. it again for their commercial. Okay. Um, so it's really cool when I'm like going through YouTube and I, I see it like, you know, real Canadian superstore and I do the do, 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 do. And I'm like, I know who oh, sound that. Is. I know what that is. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool, man. And doing it for that world is a little different too when you're writing songs specifically for it because it's a different like mindset. It is fun as long as you're not. I let. I have like ADHD, so I'm kind of all over the place with my stuff. I, I can't, I don't want to sit in one area for too long. I just like to jump around and just keep my, myself This, this gives you a bit of diversity right yeah, now. Yeah, it's so the much fun. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm having, a f I'm having a blast. So you you wouldn't say you're enjoying one one area more than the other. You wouldn't say you're enjoying K-pop more than maybe what you're doing. I think I'm enjoying it the most. I would say maybe I'm enjoying it the most. Uh, but I am, like, again, I get excited about, you know, so many different things. I'm more, I don't know. I just I just love working on music. I love creating. I love writing songs. I love making beats. That's just what I, that's why I'm on earth. Okay. In my opinion. Like, that's my purpose here is to just create. And that's all I do. So I'm, I'm happy that I get to do that every day. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the Charmaine stuff and we are going to get to her. But before we get to Charmaine, um, we kind of have to talk about how you actually really established yourself in the music scene first. Okay. Um, so people, so for people listening at home, Lance really, Lance created something in Toronto that I personally haven't really felt before. Like I, I and I know we have lots of success stories that come out of Toronto, you know, your Drake's, The Weeknd, whatnot. They're bigger artists, but like I'm old enough to remember what they what it felt like in the city when they were coming out and we weren't supporting them. Mm. Right? We were not supporting Drake, we were not supporting The Weeknd. We were waiting for the Americans to tell us that they were cool so that we could get behind them. Yeah. Right? Toronto yeah. just couldn't be like, "Yo, that's our guy. Put him on." Yeah. You know what I mean? It yeah. took us it took us some time other people to catch on to the music yeah so what you guys did what you and jazz cartier did if we can get jazz up on the screen really quickly this was the artist that you you developed right you guys you guys worked with each other right yeah we we developed uh, the sound uh, a really good sound together it, yeah, yeah yeah exactly so what i was gonna say is like you started off with this guy jazz and we're gonna talk about this entire story like, I really want to highlight the fact that what you guys did with this project, mm. I don't feel like it's been done before. The energy that you guys created in the city hasn't been matched since yeah. then. And I say that because Toronto is not very quick to accept our own. We don't really get behind the people from this city. And I don't know how it happened, but we did it for these two. Like, the city was actually behind them full force. They were selling out shows everywhere they would put it up. Yep. Right to the point where you had to move venues, get bigger venues. Yeah. And then the whole thing kind of just, it just took off. It yeah. took off a little bit too fast almost for me as an outsider looking at it. Yeah. Right. So let's rewind a little bit okay. and circle back and tell me about how you got started with jazz. Realistically, like we, him and I, <clears throat> I would have been, I don't know, uh, like 19, 20 years old. Um, and, you know, just right place, right time. I just kept, you know, always someone asked me, Hey, you want to go do the session somewhere? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Like, especially in the beginning when you're just, you, you got to do, you got to take every session you can because you need the experience. You need that grind time. And so I ended up going to a studio and you know, him and I cross paths and I heard what he was doing and I'm like, let me show you what I'm working on. And you know, we kind of exchanged contact info cause we were both just like, yo, I really, I really like what you're doing. You liked what I was doing. Yeah. Um, 
and we just hit it off no problem and how, then, how old was jazz at the time uh 17 okay 16, so you guys maybe. were young we were young we you were, were young. super young bro so jazz didn't have a pro- like he didn't have like a steady producer at the time no. and you didn't have a steady artist at the time you no. guys were just kind of doing you know work wherever you can get work yeah which is a very important um a very important equation of what you just said is that 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 having build build the band you yeah. know that's yeah. what we did we built a two-man band uh and that's essentially what it was um me if, on all the instruments, him on the lead vocals, and that's essentially what it be, what it was because that's what it became. Where you know, we kind of trusted each other with both of those things, um, and that is where it led us to you know working on a whole project together that came out, you know, that we kind of got rid of from the from the internet, and then that's when Universal started kind of taking an interest in us, um, and then at that time we were starting to work on the first iteration of Marauding in Paradise. Mm-hmm. Um, MIP, yeah. Yeah, and so the first iteration of Marauding in Paradise, we actually finished, I think it was 16 songs, got it mixed, getting ready to go to master, and then him and I listened to the whole thing top to bottom, and we just looked at each other and we were like, do you think we should, uh, you think we should scrap this and just start again? Mm-hmm. And we're like, you know what? I think we can. I think we should build it again from the ground up, because I think we know, I think we're at a special place right now um, that... I think that what we do right now is going to be great. And so we scrapped an entire 16 song album and then just straight everything that we did from that point up until the release of Marauding in Paradise is what Marauding in Paradise became. So what made you guys scrap that album, the first 16? Like mm-hmm. what what were you not happy with? Were you not happy with your production quality? Were you not happy with the writing? And how did you know that you guys could do better if you can just scrap this and start over again? Um, like what, what, what gave you the confidence to just not just push through with what you already because had? Because I think again, like it's that intuition of knowing that, like, I think it was right around the end of that phase. We were starting to write some really good songs mm. and so we you, were just like, we're somewhere special. Yeah. And I think that was the thing that we were able to tell, like, yeah, we have a bunch of good songs, but this first half, it doesn't have the sauce that this sauce, this, the, en- this the energy like, in the, pr- in, in the studio started everything changing, just started ramping up and we yeah, were just yeah. like, let's just do it. And we just, we just went off, which is probably the best thing you did because that project still today is, yeah. I look at it very much as a body of work, Yeah, which is hard to say for most albums. It's very mm. cohesive. It sounds, it's very well put together. Even the arrangement of the songs is great. The way one out, al- one song leads into the, another, all of that. And I, 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 to me, I'm so happy that you appreciate that because all of that was thought. Of course. All of that was thought through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We decided what song will lead into where, how many songs would be on there. It wasn't like this is just a body of a bunch of songs. Like we wanted to make sure that we touched on a bunch of different palettes. Yes. We wanted to touch on a couple different feelings of emotions that we were dealing with at the time and really going through that whole process together and being able to have it all. And you were scripting the album, right? Like yes. there was probably emotions that you wanted, subject matter that you needed to hit. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily just trying to make hit records. It, yeah. You were trying to convey a message mm-hmm. and you were trying to tell the come up story of jazz. Yeah, we were we were just trying to make great songs that we felt passionate about, that we felt expressed who we were as people. Right. Um. And, and it really, to me, I feel like we really refined the process once we got to Hotel Paranoia because that was... One of my favorites. I, I love them both. Mm-hmm. Um, Which one do you like better? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's really a hard one to, to think of, um, like, which one I would say over the other one. But yeah, I, like MIP just has some phenom- like, oh, man. Yeah, I, I'm, For going, me, I'm like, like going through it right now. I'm like, damn, which one would I pick if I had to pick one for me? I, the reason why I like Hotel Paranoia is because the way the intro, the way it starts off, like you're going through this like mind of him. Like you're going through his mind and it's it's in the disguise of like a hotel where like you're going through his paranoia. You're going up to this, you know, his room, his minds, his thoughts. Yeah. And then he's going through all this chaos in his life at this time because we had just come off of Marauding in Paradise. Right. right. So now we're like we were like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, it was a, it was challenging working on that album because of the success of the first one. And you're like, OK, now do it again, guys. And we're like, fuck. And the sound changed a little bit too on the second one. It got, the production got a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, we evolved a little bit. We tried more things. We tried pushing the envelope a little bit more. Even uh, with the videos, you guys were, I think it was Red Alert where he did that video in VR. The VR 360 the VR video. VR 360. Crazy. Right? Crazy video the, idea. The, the entire time, like, see, we're, now it, it feels like very normal, but at the time, it, everything was kind of pushing the envelope. Yeah. Um, like, this guy was crowd surfing, he was doing all the rock star uh stuff in at concerts 
way crazy. before it was normalized right i like, watched this guy take like you know those big brooms i watched him just take a big broom just like the big sweeping brooms and just spin it and just throw it into the crowd at yeah. like a music festival and i'm I, like yo are we gonna get sued for this <laughs> like someone gets hurt we're screwed bro yeah it's so much fun and his shows i don't know i think we we may have the, the some of the footage live um of the from the show that oh, we can man so this is actually from my I, I was just trying to find some some um some shots from that i had on my phone so i think can we play this can we get this up what's going on Okay, we're having technical difficulties here, I think. Look at this. He's standing. Yeah. He's standing on... This was not normal back then. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. This is what... And this is Toronto. And yeah, Toronto, bro. Toronto putting on for their own. And like for me, I haven't seen that since. I don't feel like we've really gotten behind an artist like that. He's also a phenomenal performer. He's a phenomenal He's a phenomenal per performer, man. Like I oh, Jazz God. is the full package and like he has everything down. Down yeah. from like the stage performance to the persona, the aesthetics, to the, the aesthetics, everything. the music. Yeah. He was the full package. Yeah, he's special. He's he, something he, special, man. Absolutely um so i guess like i i have to ask the obvious question uh so you guys i guess the relationship kind of changed over the years yeah right yeah so like i think by the third album or by the fourth album your involvement on it was not as significant as it was on the first and second album yeah i think the way you guys were approaching music creatively had also changed yeah and then you guys essentially kind of went on your own directions nothing crazy like it wasn't anything there was no beef or anything but you just were creatively in different spaces and you kind of parted ways is that is that a fair yeah yeah i mean i feel like uh i feel like this went from like a podcast to like a, a late night uh yeah. interview show where people like tuned <laughs> well the fans want to know what's going on <laughs> i'm like here we, we're getting into the juicy stuff now here we go strap in ladies and gentlemen um so <sighs> It was, it really was, um, a place of like creative differences where, you know, I saw it one way, he saw it another way. Yeah. Um, and you know, we were butting heads a lot with certain things and, you know, while we were still making a lot of great songs too, at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think we just felt at the overall, the, the we both had two different visions of how it was going to go. Right. Um, and there was just, there was also, you know, for being honest, there was a lot of pressure. For sure. There was a lot of pressure on pressure both of us. The from labels. The labels. Yeah. From everything. Right. And um Yeah, there was a lot of pressure for, like, for both of us, if I'm gonna be honest, man. Like, I, like there was a lot, and it, it, it that that definitely played a big part for him and I. Um Was it the was it the moment when the labels were asking you for a record? Because I if I recall, there were you guys were giving you guys gave them a couple of singles, and then I think they were asking you to rework some things. And yeah, we we started getting involved with the the states. Uh, Capital had then entered the room. Yeah, um, which was another label representing jazz on the American side. On the American side. Yeah. So you guys yeah. had the Canadian side, which was Warner Chapel. Uh, Universal. Universal. Yeah. You were under Warner Chapel. I was under Warner. You Chapel. were Warner, but the 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 actual album was Universal. Yeah. And then you had the pressures from the state. Yeah, that's right. That is when things got and so really. Then, you know, it, it's double stacking there now. Yeah. And then, yeah. <clears throat> you know, kind of being um, the head producer of that, it, it, it's coming to me. Of course. And then yeah. I got to now go and I got to be the one to talk to jazz. You yeah, know? yeah. And it's yeah. just like a lot of times, too, I would just be like, then like you can talk to them, too, you know. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So there was there was a lot of times, dude, where just communication, the communication pretty good. was yeah bro it was all over the place and i feel like as i reflect on it right now in this moment actually which is pretty crazy uh yeah like the amount of pressure that him and i were under for that product uh was insane and i it like we were so young at the time too like it's it, super it, it, young like, dude if i reflect back to that like you guys if he was sitting here right now you he would probably say the same thing dude the amount of pressure that him and i were under working on that like it didn't even matter I probably had nothing to do with the music. We no, were just no, under no, so no. much pressure from everything. 100%. And like, we're just trying to like, we're trying to like do what we got to do. And there know? was probably a lot of he said, she said, like, because you're probably talking to a whole bunch of different label reps. They're all expecting you, expecting different things from you. And yeah. then there's at some point the communication will break down and someone's going to expect you to do something that you didn't do. Yeah. And problems stem from there. But overall, I think we, we ended up working on the Forever thing. Mm -hmm. um, I worked on, you know, 
a couple songs and then that was when i was like you know i'm kind of off the project um and then once it got finished up <clears throat> again no bad blood at all because realistically like he, he they had finished the album he hit jazz had called me and i remember he was just like yo like i, I need you to mix the album yeah like, can you please mix that for us and i'm just like you know they were, they were on like revision 17 of the album at this time and i'm like yep. this is ridiculous so yep. i got it back to him in a week you know like minimal notes he was very happy with the way that it came out i'm happy with the way that it came out i think forever is still a great body of work as well yeah um obviously like my favorite songs on that album and the best songs in the album are probably the ones i produced <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding there's some amazing songs there's yeah, some yeah, amazing yeah. songs on no, there, ja but jazz is a great artist he's awesome no he's, he's incredible awesome. man and he's I'm, awesome. I, I you know he's doing his thing still right now and I, I have so much respect for him and i, I hope he keeps doing it you know because he's still putting out some really great songs and he I'll, is. I'll bump them every now and then and not to stay on this topic for too long but yeah. just to quickly just wrap this up yeah um he did put out a song cheddar where he you know mentions you yeah and he says he can't even pick he can't even i don't know the actual lyric but it's something along the lines of i can't even pick up the phone and call lance anymore mm -hmm. right so i'm listening to this and i'm thinking that he might just be feeling again i don't know i have no idea yeah but it, it just it might feel it might it's to me it seems like you guys have both probably moved on mm -hmm. and i feel like if you guys just picked up the phone yeah things would be good I can't remember if we talked just before that or after that. So there was communication when that song came out. I don't remember. I don't remember if it was before or after. Okay. It's hard for me to remember. There's just so much has happened over the last few years. So it's like a... But just for the fans watching things. at home, it, there's always a chance that, you know, you guys could be on good, good terms. For sure. Because Absolutely. I don't think there's no bad blood. There's no, no, there's none of that. No. You know, Lance and Jazz could always be homies. They could, there, there could Absolutely. be things that happen down the road. That's yeah. all I want. I just want to clear that up. For people not to make it seem like you guys had a falling out yeah i think no, no, that's no, no. the most important thing yeah yeah, yeah, yeah right no, not, not to say there's new music but just to say that everything is good yeah yeah, yeah. okay dope dope yeah. so one more thing to talk about because i think this is really important for the young producers watching at home um it's kind of how ja how lance came across jazz and i want to speak to this because lance really had to put himself in certain situations as a kid to get to where he is now and i think these are situations where a lot of people would shy away from. They wouldn't want to do this because there's no immediate payoff. And it takes somebody with a vision to be able to commit to this and do work without reaping the rewards of it immediately. Yeah. So to that, can you kind of just tell the audience about all the little things that you had to do in your come up? In terms of the people you would have to work with, the late nights, the doing working on projects that you don't want to work on, just so that you can get some experience with your DAWs, just getting experience of what it's like being in a studio, being with other people in a room, etc. Yeah. All that builds you up and all that gives you character. Yeah, bro. Um, you know, I think a lot of producers, I think I can start off with this, is that you need to get you need to get your reps in and you need to learn how to work with people in a room. Yep. So the people that you're working with in the room aren't just staring at the back of your head. Right. Because that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Right? You need to be able to do what you got to do, turn around, be with the writers, be with the artists, be active, be a part of the process. Help the artist, help the writer, whoever's working on the song at that time, help them evolve and become the best version of themselves. The only way you get to do that is by getting those reps in early on. You don't know what it's like to work with a good artist because you've never worked with a good artist, but you've never worked with a bad artist. Mm -hmm. So you don't know the difference. I so love the, that. the way that you need to approach it is you need to approach it by, I will work with any artist that's willing to work with me. Mm -hmm. And so I can get a scope of what good and bad is. Right. I can learn my strengths and weaknesses, what I need to work on as a, as a producer writer. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, not being afraid to speak up sometimes, but also sometimes knowing your place. Sometimes you just need to step back and just breathe and let it be what it is. And sometimes you need to step in a little bit more. But the only way you learn that gauging system is by getting out there and taking those sessions with those artists, trying to get in the room with those people. I know a lot of things are, you know, everything's done remotely now. But if you can do your best, I'm sure there's local artists in every city, you know, there's rappers everywhere. 
literally everywhere <laughs> it's a it's a race between whether there's more rappers or real estate agents now. yeah 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 um there's a little cross branding for you um so it's the race between whether there's more rappers or real estate agents so you got a lot of both so you, you someone's going to help you buy a home and someone's going to help you get better at recording a song so really quickly because you said a lot there but i think the most important thing that you said there was yeah. or you were you were saying is yeah, you're a producer, you're an engineer, whatever. But like the the skill that you really acquired was developing people. Yeah. Right. People Talking skills. to people. It's the human skills. Yeah. That's the part that a lot of people lack. Like yeah. you could be as good as you want as a producer, but like yeah. you have to know how to work the room. Yeah. Right. You have to know how to lift an artist up when they're feeling down or when they just can't. And I can tell you this because. You know, on this show, you know, with me working on it, this guy has been like a battery in my back consistently. Anytime I've had a low, I can know I can turn to this guy. And the way you would motivate me, I just like know that that you can't do that without all the experience you've accumulated yeah. over the last 12 years. It's like sometimes I'm like, yo, this guy's in my head right now. Yeah. Like he knows, <laughs> you know exactly how an artist thinks. Yeah the roadblocks that they encounter and mm. then how to overcome those roadblocks. Yeah. You're like, you're really sick at that. Thank you, bro. Thank <laughs> you. I, I, I try to be, it's a really important thing because you know, and it, with all of the artists that I've worked with, they, they sometimes do get in their own head over certain things. Yeah. You got to just help them be like, wait a minute. Like you are doing something great. It's not as serious as you think. You're overthinking it. Back to basics. Let's just start. Just relax. Yeah. Just breathe. It, you're overthinking it. Live for a couple of days, then reassess it. That's usually a better method to go about things, too. Well, I think what's so dope about you is like you're not just saying the words like you actually believe it. I know that you do because you don't get frustrated. You yeah. don't like if, if you didn't believe the words you were saying. Yeah. Trust me, you would get frustrated. Yeah. Right. After an hour <laughs> of the artist not being able to execute on the thing that you've been asking them to execute. Yeah. But you don't you know, I've never seen you get frustrated. I've always just seen you try to work through the problem. Yeah, I think, you know, and I do that still with certain writers. Um, I had it happen in a session not too long ago. And it's just like, yeah, man, you just need to. I feel like you really got to stay. You got to stay in control. You got to control the room control the energy and really sometimes just help the writer vocalist whoever you're working with to just get through those things because you know that they can deliver you know that they can you know you know that they can give you the best quality yeah um you just need to sometimes help guide them a little bit and that's and, it and it's about the end product right and you yeah. just need to be patient because you know the moment you get that right take and that right time you get to that end point you're like oh damn amazing yeah perfect this is what we were here for this is what we worked for and then the artist is super satisfied and everyone's happy I, I exactly and so like you know I, whenever i describe the the sound that lance has to people i the only word i can use to describe it is it, it's expensive you basically polish people what's the term that you uh that we uh can i say the term okay go ahead <laughs> what is it Pol polish shit oh yeah yeah you want to just like <laughs> learn to polish it yeah that's what it is that's what that's, it is that's what happens when you just start out in the beginning dude if you can just make you know bad things still sound great it's yeah. like you know you're doing something right like yeah. you just want to constantly be able to like make a bad situation good because I, I i've heard it like myself i've like because in your on your come up you had to work with a lot of artists i'm sure you still do but like i've heard the befores and afters of artists bro night and day, night it's, and day. it's night and day yeah. it's like you you make everybody sound high end and polished like a professional artist because you as a producer it's also your job I think I put that on myself, but I think that it's really important that you help an artist unlock their true potential, which, yeah. Right. Cause like when you're working with an artist, they're in the room with you because they obviously want to be an artist. And I think a lot of artists are really talented. It's just once they find their voice and you yes. want to help them find their voice, find that, you know, attitude that makes them, them find that special something. And once you find that special something, you're like that tap into that more. And then it's a lot of keeping them on that. Yeah, yeah, coaching yeah. them onto that where it's like you're drifting away from that you know you have to remember nurture. who you are and get back there and and you're constantly bringing them back to there yeah yeah which yeah. is yeah and then you know easier said than done definitely easier said definitely. than done especially when like i mean you can only coach somebody up to a certain point they gotta want to do it themselves they gotta want to do it themselves and they have which, to put in their own reps as well like again there's certain times where you're just like you know they're not Sometimes they just don't have it. Well, I think maybe artists might be coming to you and they might think, oh, I got Lance in the room. He's going to he's going to make the sound. He's going to make the so song sound incredible. So they kind of step back a little bit when really they should be matching your energy, if not going above you. So that's why I like to go into the 
market that I'm in now. And exactly. Because I feel because like everything is up here. Everything is up here. Up here. Yeah, like yeah, I'll get yeah, songwriters, yeah. you know, be like, hey, <clears> man, <throat> you should you should step it up a bit. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I love that. That's amazing. I love that. that. That That's the constructive criticism that you need to get better. Yeah, you need that. And again, if you're around a bunch of yes men, you're never going to grow. Yeah. So yeah. you need some you need some good friends or some good people that you work with that are willing to be like, yo, this this is amazing. But I think you could like step up this part. Don't just be around people either that are just like, nah, I don't know. I don't really like it. It's like, why don't you like it? Yeah. And if they have no answer, they're just talking. You know what I mean? And but if. You want to be around the people that are going to give you that constructive criticism, that constructive feedback. You know, you want to be around those types of people because they're and the ones that are accepting help you grow. of it too. I think that's like the the key, right? They have to be accepting of the of the feedback. They can't look at it as like, oh, Lance is getting on me right now. He yeah, like, yeah. So, so speaking to that, you're working with some people right now in the city. I am um, working with a couple of people in the city. Uh, one that I'm super excited about um, is Driver95. Super talented. Having so much fun. Like, yeah. You, you know. guys definitely should check him out. He also has the full package. And, you know, part, part of that is thanks to you. But, like, that's, I can't wait to see what you two are about to do. Yeah, but that, show me. He's, he's incredibly talented, man. And um, I'm excited to see where he's going. Like, every time we do a new song, it just, he's just elevated, elevating, elevating, elevating. It's just, non-stop just yeah. really investing in himself too which is another thing that i think is really important because here an artist needs to be everything you gotta be an influencer you gotta be posting your videos you gotta tell do this, me about you it bro that. look at me right now I know. <laughs> look at me right now <laughs> yeah but what are your tiktok numbers though um yeah dude and it's, it's that grind and and again it's like you know artists they're like you know I want to, I want to be the best artist in the world. It's like, oh, then prove it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, do yeah. It. Like, show I, me that you, you want show, this. Show me that you want it. Because yeah. again, it's like, like we were saying earlier, like for me, it's like, it's, it's not the gear, it's the ear. Mm. So it doesn't really matter if you don't have the right gear or whatever, the proper stuff, or it's not the highest quality. It's like, you can make great things out of next to nothing. You yeah. Know? Like, um, was it outcast? Thank Onia. They, I'm pretty sure they recorded that album in a bathtub. Done. with a shower curtain how many records Lil wayne has recorded in a hotel room yeah how many records drake recorded in a hotel, hotel room? room there's yeah. videos of travis scott just with a blanket over his head and the microphone just so that they can iso the room and he can do his takes and that's on your favorite album yeah so like, you know what like even for me in doing this i would say you're right like you can create as many you can set up as many obstacles as you want yeah right you can say i need this to get to do get this done this to get this done this to get this done when in actuality all we're really saying is just get started yeah if the product is good it will show it It'll will speak shine for itself and It'll you're just you're so much more creative i think that we have too many options just start limiting yourself yeah that, that's like a you you use a really good uh example with me actually you're like yo you have too many crayons in the coloring box yeah Right? Or was it crayons in the pencil case? Yeah. Pick three colors yeah. and make the b best piece of art that you can make. Yeah. If you're talented, you'll make a, a great painting with just three colors. Easily. Right? Easily. Yeah. Okay. So, yo, Darren, how long have we been going for? Minutes. That's a pretty good uh, episode. How amazing, you feel? Amazing, bro. Thank you so much, man. Listen, I feel amazing. <laughs> we wanted to keep today's episode short as the previous one before. You know, as I said, these guys are not guests, they're collaborators. You're going to see this guy on the show regularly. He's going to be my go-to guy when I want to speak about music, business, whatever it is. Whenever I have questions about the entertainment game, I'm going to this guy. Absolutely, and I, you know I'm going to pick up the phone. <laughs> I'm always down for that. I can't wait to get into one of those with you. Yeah, man. So listen, it was a great episode. I had fun. Yes. You had fun. Darren Delon, thank you guys. Thank you guys. And we will see you on the very next episode next Wednesday. Peace. Good episode. Great episode. <laughs> Great episode.